Welcome to the Courage Barbell Unlimited Podcast with your host, legendary powerlifter and strength athlete, Chad Ikes. For most, the journey of strength starts in the gym, but should inevitably expand through all aspects of life. Join us as we discuss all things strength. Now, here's your host, Chad Ikes. Hey everybody, today we have another special guest, Josh Bryant of Jailhouse Strong. Uh, the interesting thing is when I, Josh actually started powerlifting before me and was quite a bit younger than me because I didn't start till I was like 27. So I remember at the 2003 Senior Nationals. Oh, Burbank. Yeah, we, we actually were there together competing. We didn't know each other at the time. And I just remember I was like 31 and that was like my first big meet. And I'm like, this kid's like 22. (laughs) And I, you were a weight, you were 308. I was a super, but I think you still out totaled me. And I was just like, holy shit. Like this kid's crazy. This is amazing. And I think you ended up with uh, a ninth, a nine hundred squat, a six thirty three bench, a seven fifty deadlift, and a twenty two ninety two total. Yeah, something right about there is. So you're you're an accomplished power lifter, but I think people probably at this point know you more from Jailhouse Strong. Could be. Then 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 even I don't know if people understand know like you're lifting and you started. I was actually looking on open powerlifting, and like you did a meet when you were like fifteen and bench like. 308 i think yeah yeah yeah. which is that's Uh crazy for 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 a 15 year old that's a damn good bench i I started yeah i was i was lifting you know seriously at 12 and and started jacking around with about six so you started lifting when you were six yeah (laughs) that's awesome not 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 structured or like no but like playing around enough to like my dad said if, if we had a bench press, like it was like a uh, uh, like a universal bench press, mm-hmm. and you, he said if you you know do a, you could take this bench out and do a leg press, like a vertical kind of leg. Did that, and then I was basketball was my main sport, and he said like a lat pull down looks like a rebound. I'm like it does to me too. So I did leg press, lat pull downs, and like partial range of motion machine bench, like multiple times a week. And then by the time I got to 12, joined the YMCA and actually got you know free weights and real stuff at that point. Right. So what did you finish, like, when you were a competing team, what was your best numbers? Competing what? When you were a teen? Um, I think my best um, official would have been um, 523 bench, um, 727 squat, and a 6... For sure, a six fifty deadlift, and I got up like a six sixty one or something or, or six sixty seven, whatever, and it didn't count. You know, I I like yeah. made the lift. It was you know I, I I hitched it. Wow, those are really good team numbers. So then, fast yeah. forward, and you've you've done amazing with jailhouse strong you've trained i don't even know how many people you've actually trained you've had trained lots of top lifters and i remember it what was it two years ago i went to i was at swiss and i listened to your talk okay yeah yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. which was which was really cool and it's interesting i think sometimes people get this image in their head and you know with jailhouse strong and everything they're like oh josh trained so hard but you talked a lot about recovery too Mm -hmm. which I think is a thing that a lot of lifters are actually missing now. Like everybody can train hard. Lots of people train hard, but are they smart enough to pin that training hard with recovering enough? I think, you know, I I see the airs both ways of like a lot of people that train hard, don't care about recovery, but then I see the flip side too of some people are so obsessed with recovery. They don't ever train hard. So I think, that, you know, that's kind of ultimately, you know, if you can balance those two things, that's when you optimize results. You know, you have, you know, you have a stimulus to recover and adaptation like that. That's how it rolls. So, you know, are you are you getting the stimulus? You know, maybe not. Are you getting the recovery? Maybe not. Right. Well, if you're not getting either of those things, you ain't getting the adaptation. So and that's what we're after. Yes. And, I, you know, at the Swiss group, 
the talk about recovery be really important because those are going to be people that are very serious about it. I mean, think about most people there aren't like living in Columbus and just, you know, walking in. They paid good money to come. They traveled across the country and in some cases across the world. So that's a pretty motivated group. So I think it was extremely important to touch on recovery. Yeah, I, th- I, I, I completely agree. There's, there's, you either have one side or the other, the people that just don't do enough. <clears throat> and that's probably something that I need to remember because I tend to talk to lifters, like competitive lifters. Yeah. And, and, aggr- and I'm an aggressive person. I tend to think in aggressive people. And no, there's and- still plenty of people that ain't doing shit for lack of a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're not well- getting a nearest stimulus, you know? Because, like, the thing is, they might see other, you know, you seem to see that when you first start out lifting. I remember seeing people that were older and they would not do very much. And how are they so strong? Well, it takes a lot less to, it takes a lot more to gain than it does to maintain. And you have to remember that you have to put in a certain amount of work to continually gain. But once you've gotten that, assuming your lifestyle is not haphazard, you can do a lot less and, and maintain those gains. So, you know, it all depends on, on where you want to go. Yes, that's true. I, I also think that, I mean, as you progress, if you're a younger athlete, right. you don't have the technique, you don't have the muscle control, you're not recruiting the fibers, like you can push really hard and still recover from so. it. The better you get, the older you get, I found that you need more of that recovery. I think there's a good point there. So it's not just necessarily age, it's also or not just necessarily strength, it's a combination of both because that's what's interesting about powerlifting, I think, is most things when you get good at them, you're going to do more. And powerlifting, the the reality is you're going to do less. Like you can benefit a lot early on from a pretty good amount of volume, you know, frequency, things like that. But as you evolve and get better, you need to actually do less. And that that's different than a lot of other sports, you know. And I think that's – it's because it's not a very skilled thing. I mean, it's skilled to a point, but like, I mean, yeah, I think like there's been like people that have advocated, you know, not deadlifting and still like Louis Simmons, not doing like a lot of heavy, but actually produce good deadlifters. Right. What other sport, like, you don't say like basketball, like, you know, just don't practice free throws. And then you go out and shoot 90% of the free throw line. You, you have to practice it. So powerlifting is one of those things that there is some skill to it. So that's why I wouldn't advocate not deadlifting, but it is low enough skill where you can do it not very often, if much at all. Glenn Shabbat was benching what? Like, I think he was doing a full range of motion, heavy bench press every three to four weeks, you know? And there is cl- countless examples of like the more, I, you know, I call it smarter. So like the more neurologically proficient in skill involved in a particular endeavor, the more you got to practice it. Where like, you know, Olympic lifting, very high skill. You have to practice it all the time. Where powerlifting is, you know, there is an element of skill. Strength is a skill to display, but you know, in a large, by and large, it's a point, an, an equation of brute force, which is, i.e., get your, you know, gain, ma- you know, gain muscle mass, increase your force production, and then of course recover so you can do it harder, you know, better than you did before. Where Olympic lifting, you could get stronger, you know, more explosive. But if you don't know how to like, you know, say drop under a snatch, it may not transfer, even though all the other, you know, variables that should indicate something are, are increasing. Yes. So, I mean, yeah. So the more, the more athletic, the movement, the more neurological, the movement, the more you got to practice it. A hundred percent. Which completely makes sense. And I, I also think that that has to do with like, <clears throat> I look at, I think about the body. Uh-huh. And I'm like, okay, so if you're, you know, there's this concept that if you train more, you can lift more and you can build how often you train the frequency of your training up. But I think, well, wait a minute. I'm not, when I'm training, I'm making my muscles bigger. I might, I'm make, going to make my bones a little denser. I'm going to make my tendons and ligaments stronger. Mm-hmm. But what am I doing to my organs and my brain? Like they're not increasing in size. They're not getting better. Like I can only produce so much of, of each hormone. Like I can't train my body to produce more of that to a certain extent. That's what it does. Well, you know, and it's interesting you say that because that's what Mike Mincer, which again, I'm mm-hmm. not like necessarily advocating him. Like I, I like, you know, learn different things for different people. 
just how I don't like not die hard West side, but definitely picked up good stuff from Louis Simmons and, and some stuff from Mike Mincer here is he talked about, and I, I, I've quoted this numerous times, but I'm not actually quoting it because I'm paraphrasing it, but I'm, I don't know the exact numbers. The concept is when you start lifting weights, you're going to increase your strength from where your baseline was day one by like three to four, say to three, 400 percent. Like, you know, you bench a hundred pounds, you can get up to three, 400 kind of thing. Okay. Well, your recovery, your recuperative ability, he said, increased by about 40%. So basically your strength potential, you're at, you know, can go up four times where you're at, but your recuperative ability is about 40% increase. So 400 versus 40. So there's 10 times more strength potential potentially gain than there is your ability to recover. So I think, you know, I don't know if that's accurate or studied or what, but I do agree that you don't keep getting your potential for gaining strengths more than your ability to recover from it. So that, that is a huge thing. And then this also even comes down to, I think beyond what you're saying, which is a damn good point. I've not heard many people phrase it that way, but that's an excellent way to look at it is also what muscle group it is. For example, your lower back to me, that's really hard to make recover faster. We're like your hamstrings are a little harder to make recover as fast, but like your quads, if like all you did is like a, a sled drag say backwards and, and made it quad dominant. I think you could do that pretty soon every day, pretty hard. And as long as you're just not going ape shit, like central nervous system fatigue, but like hard training, but never like complete grinder. I think you do that every single day and be okay. You could build up to that where I don't think you could do like weighted Nordic leg curls or glute ham raises every single day um with any kind of maximal efficiency no matter how hard you do it so there, there's that part of it too you know which, what i'm saying which would so. make sense though going back to my school days because you know the muscles are all a little bit different like you could pound the shit out of your calves and they'll take walk. it but your calves are also made to do they're made for you to walk all day like it, it's a different even muscle if you hardly move you're gonna walk a couple thousand steps a day that's if you hardly do yeah you don't just walk the house and go outside get your mail kind of thing that's a lot of reps. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, say for your hamstrings, for instance, like when you're running and stuff, your glutes, they don't, they don't really get active till you're like at top speed or top or near top speed. So even if you jogged, you're not really getting a lot of work there. Right. Where like you just, like you're in your forearms. Like I'm going to, you know, this Topo Chico bottle, I can just walk around, carry whatever. And, and then we recover pretty quick. So as long as you're not going like absolutely crazy, they should be able to recover faster. I also wonder too, I wondered this, especially when I was competing more, because it's like, okay, well, I can, I can squat 1200 pounds, mm -hmm. but even 800 pounds was, I mean, there was a certain point where it was just heavy and it's like, how much is the human body relative. It's adapted not relative. to do this? So even if you go, well, I squat 12, so today I'm deloading and I'm going to do 900. I'm like, are you really deloading? That's still a shit ton of stress on your body. Well, that's an interesting point because like, I mean, they've done for like rest periods, for example, they've done studies that show like basically as you get stronger, 60% is not 60%. So you squat a thousand, you squat 600 for 10 reps. It's going to take a few minutes, minimally, probably 10 minutes or so to recover. Where if you, you know, squat 500 to 300 for reps, you're going to recover pretty fast. So it's definitely not, it's not just like, oh, it's 60% and right. it takes a few minutes to recover or whatever. And then- you know, on top of that, you're talking about like, that's, that's a whole other animal. It's like why equipped lifting can be pretty complicated is because you just said you're handling that much weight, but at the same time, there is more of a skill component with like the equipment, you mm -hmm. know, with what raw, once you got it down, I mean, you kind of got it down. You just got to figure out how to get stronger and not get hurt and recover with equipped. I've had experience in both. I know if you gain like, you know, eight pounds, it can like, you can't hit depth in the squat seat. Then all of a sudden you lose it and lose too much. And, you know, you just go straight down to the bottom and can't come back up because it's, it's, it's too loose. So that that's a whole nother element. For sure. <clears throat> Which brings up the difference in like the, the, the years that I trained more like a bodybuilding style program, yeah. I could definitely train way more. Once I got more into powerlifting, it's like, okay, my muscles don't feel that bad, but my central nervous system's like rocked. That's why I didn't like equip lifting as much, even though raw wasn't as popular back then is I didn't like that. I, I, I talked to Ed Cohen one time. I liked feeling pumped up. I liked, 
I figured I'm not making like a bunch of money doing this or anything. So I just want to do it how I like to do it. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly why it's like, you're feeling a perpetual state of fatigue, but none of the, in my mind, none of the benefits feeling pumped up, feeling like that kind of way. It's like, dude, look, like, you know, like, Oh, it's definitely, get... it was definitely different. For, I mean, like you're at it, like when your central nervous system's like done, it changes how you think it changes how you feel. Like when I just did more <clears throat> muscular type or raw, raw yeah. training, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm a little sore, but like, I still feel okay. Feel better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think even bodybuilding training, assuming you're doing some sort of functionality, like, you know, functional hypertrophy or, or power building, something along those lines, I think you do feel better. I think if you all, if you legit only do like straight pump body, but you probably wouldn't feel as good. But if you have an aspect of like, there's still some functionality care over in life, I think you feel better doing that than you do raw powerlifting. It's just like, you know, your work capacity is higher and it's just muscular fatigue is, is kind of easy to, to deal with. It's, it, it actually feels good in a lot of ways where central fatigue does not feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. So it's like, it's, and, and it, again, you have like, that's an interesting one as a coach. When, when I talk about that, I keep trying to remind myself, I need to be specific and communicate this well. Cause I don't need a 15 year old kid going, Oh, my central nervous system's overtrained. It's like, dude, you don't even know how to overtrain your central nervous system. You're 15. No, and I've noticed that a lot too, with people that say that it's more people that like literally aren't capable of it. Yeah. But, you know, they will be eventually, but not yet. So then the people that are, you have to, especially if you're not, you know, communicating in person, like it's online. What I'll look for is just like, if it's an online deal is like that you can tell in their emails and stuff like, you know, like, yeah, you know, finish the week, all blah, blah, blah. Then it's like, you know, I might write week done the next week. Like, okay. <laughs> what, you go from like, you know, gung ho to conquer the world to like bordering on depressing here. What's going on? You know, I'll yeah. like. I don't know, I just feel kind of tired. Like, okay, you're essentially kind of fatigued there. I got you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. So you did. I, I reposted a video. I don't know if it was new off Instagram yesterday or the other day. And mm -hmm. and you were talking about uh, like growth and, and fixed mindset. And this is it. I made the video a while ago. But that's the first time I had posted it. That was, that just, was an awesome video. Like I'm like, like I, ha I have to repost this. Because it seems like the more... <clears throat> since I haven't competed in, in quite a while now, I still Hello. try, I still try to lift heavy because I love it. But so, but I'm, you know, working with more Who's clients. Last time you competed? Oh, I did like a deadlift meet probably like four or five years ago. And how old are you now? 52. Dude, you could like dominate though, huh? Because like you're over 50, you could. Yeah, but I don't like. You've broken I, them holes. I have this issue, like the masters thing for me, I kind of feel like that's for like people that didn't really compete or like weren't at the highest level. So, One way to look at it, but the thing is they got, they got an advantage in a lot of ways because they had no miles earlier on. That's true too. I mean, dude, like. It's yeah. a whole idea. Like if you're older and you come in and start powerlifting at 50 and you didn't have all these years of beating yourself up. That's a huge, guy, that's first a huge guy, guy I used to train with when I was a teenager. One of the guys was the first person to deadlift over 800 in a meet at 50 years old. And really? he started at 57 because he was a cop and he got in a bad car accident. I guess he had a pretty um, forward thinking that kind of like doctors weren't really helping. He's a chiropractor's like gave him some finished deadlift routine. He's like, Hey, you know what? Like this, here's this deadlift routine that some i don't even know who did it from finland had had come up with in early in the 80s here you go and george started doing it but like he didn't have you know obviously didn't have all those miles and stuff too i mean i think there's two sides of the coin there you don't have the miles at the same time you don't have like the kind of base strength and, and that kind of thing you could have developed if you had been training so i think at the end of the day it kind of probably evens out to a degree yeah to some extent but I think I look back now, I always look, I like to look back at the, at the past as in history. Like if you don't learn history. No, I'm, with, I'm with you. I wouldn't want to do it either. It's just like one of those things of like, you know, I've done it and I don't, I don't want to do it like, I don't want to say half-assed, but I don't want to do it where if you've done it where it's like the main priority to you, it's not going to probably be fun to like do it where like, oh, I got like 
well, I didn't sleep as much last night because a business thing came up or something like that. I, I would, I've only done it like a hundred percent all in. So I, I wouldn't want to try it. Like, you know, kissing my cousin, so to speak, I'm either all it's, in. it's hard. It's hard. To, yeah. It's hard. Once you've done it all in, it's hard not to do it all in. What, I mean, I would, I would totally be open to it if I hadn't done it all in like, Hey, someone want to do it now. Yeah. And I didn't know. It better. Yeah. It'd be fun. It'd be cool. But like, once you've been in there like that, I'd have to, if I was going to compete in something, it'd have to be something totally different. Yeah. Like something new that you're picking up or whatever. So with that post you did though, I, I, I look back and I try to find commonalities in, in all the athletes. And mm. I'm like you, I think like, I'll, if I don't, even if I don't fully like a program, somebody does, if there's something I can take from it, I'll take from it. Like, I think there's a lot of knowledge in that, but I look, sure. I look at all these athletes and I go, what is the most common thing between all the top people? And of That's all, a good one. Look at it. all the top athletes that I know, they all have a really strong mindset. They all really believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And and I've been thinking about this more and more with the people I coach. And I coach a wide variety of people. Okay. Um, I coach some older people just for general. I want to help them enjoy their retirement. Mm -hmm. And even at that, I almost think, man, like I have some clients that want to lose weight, but you know, they're just not positive about it. And I'm like, even if you want to lose 20 pounds, you got to get in your head and believe in yourself. Otherwise you're kind of screwed. Well, so I think they start all start backwards with bad self-talk to start off with. So it's, it's there, there, you can tell them that they're going to say yes and all that. But if you don't start at, at, at the ground level of self-talk of like, even like kids, if I get onto my kids here, just like, one, you know, he like thought he forgot his water bottle at practice the other day. And he said, and like, that was, I'm such an idiot. It's right here. I'm like, no, you do not say that. Like he didn't normally do stuff. I don't know where that had come from, but like, that's how it's going to start of like, you know, I'd love to lose 20 pounds, but you know, I never could because I just, you know, I love to like you know drink wine or eat chocolate or whatever the hell you like to do. And you're limiting yourself at that point because you're already programming yourself to believe what you can't do. And it, it sounds like, you know, it, it, people don't think about it because you raised here, like talks cheap and all that stuff. I agree. Maybe if you say it one time, but when you keep doing that repetitively, you're going to build it like people. I mean, that's like what propaganda is like mm -hmm. propaganda is a lie told over and over till it becomes truth and, and whoever you want to believe it. So you're just giving, you know, you're going to get propaganda. Even if you're lying to yourself about, you think you can succeed you're gonna be lying to yourself the other way. So if you're thinking of lying to yourself, you might as well lie to yourself to benefit yourself and be positive about it. So you're gonna like fake it till you make it, or or you're gonna fake it and make it worse than it really is, and then it will become a self fulfilling prophecy. So my thing is, I'm gonna err. Let's always err to the side of being positive and productive. I agree. Yeah, I think that's going the other way. I just I think that I've been thinking lately about this, and I saw your saw your video, and I'm like, yeah, it's totally like everything you said in that. I may say things a little bit different, but it's the same thing. And yeah, I, for sure. It's a growth mindset. So like, that's what, that's one thing I picked up from, you know, I've done that myself already. It was like from Charles Poliquin was talking about, um, at one, me and him did a seminar one time and, or and a couple other people. And I remember him talking and he said, the, the biggest thing that got me ahead early on was everybody to always argue about what the top people were doing. Like some of the differences, like this person, does a power clean this person does you know whatever like um say a, a jump with dumbbells or something they're both trying to build explosive power okay so we have that difference we said but the commonality is say they all do like squats okay mm -hmm. so we can decipher that every single top guy is advocating squats point one you know kind of thing so like i think that's what you're on to a good thing right there is instead of always looking at all the differences are that's important to know too at some point but at first I would find what the commonalities are like of all the people you look up to admire, look to for like a source of inspiration, learning from what are some of the commonalities? There's going to be some start there. Yeah. Then once you got that done, then you can maybe look at what some of the differences are. Yeah. And then at that point you can go deeper into why do they do it? Sure. What do they need? But yeah, I, I, I mean, everybody seems to want to lean towards one area and I'm like, why not? And this is the same thing with, with, I see lifters do, well, I like so-and-so, so I'm going to train like him. And I'm like, well, just because you like him doesn't mean you should train like him necessarily. And 
Are you looking at him where he's at now? Maybe you need to go, like, what did he do when he was 20? Not what is he doing now because it's going to change over time. Well, no, it's like, you know, it's like people talk about that with, like, you know, like veganism became popular and I don't really care either way like about it, but I'm just saying like everybody, oh, this person's eating vegan now. Okay, we're a top bodybuilder. Well, they ate, you know, steaks for 30 years before that. So, you know, we have to look at always what you did to get there. Like, oh, well, this person advocates now, you know, one leg on a Bozu ball with a dumbbell above your head. But, oh yeah, what about the 25 years where they squatted heavy every single week before that, you know? Like we need to look at what got you there for sure. And I think- and to the, these people's defense, too, is at the same time, if you're not changing how you train ever, that, that's pretty stupid, probably. I mean, not only are you in a, you know, in a, an a evolving, you know, life or biological organism that should change if you've been training since you're 12 and you're 40 some years old, something has happened in there at some point. There's some changes um, and even if you have the exact same goals, there would still be some changes, but usually people are going to have some different goals. If you're training to be the strongest, super heavy, but powerful in the, you know, in the world, it's different than if you're trying to be a generalist, that's pretty good at everything. Yeah. So I think you have to be changing what you're doing too, regardless, but yeah, hundred percent, you have to, I'm with you. So in your video, you mentioned something in the beginning about gratitude, but you didn't mention any more after that. I wanted to I, I kind of follow the manifestation principles, at least, you know, I always pick out what I like best, but, and right. they always talk about gratitude. So I was curious to hear your, what you think. Well, I think that. for one is gratitude is going to put you in a, in a better state of mind, period. I mean, there, there's just no doubt about that. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that. It's like, if you walk into a restaurant, like your favorite restaurant, you walk in and it smells so good. And this is awesome. Then 10 minutes later, you used to smell. You don't even think it smells good anymore. It's just mm -hmm. you be adapted to it. And I think that's how gratitude is. Is like if you don't make a daily practice of it of some sort, uh, you're going to have issues of like having it. Just not because you're a bad person. Just you become adapted to it. So like what I've done personally is a couple different ways. Is um, one, you know, five minutes or so when you wake up, just write down what you're grateful for. I'd write down like, you know, it could be, what happened in your entire life, like to your good elementary school teachers to like what's happened, you know, recently, like, you know, a good night's sleep, great workout training session yesterday, that kind of thing. What I've also done too is they have, um, you can get free apps, gratitude apps. So like, it will just be like a little journal you keep on your phone. I do think there's something powerful about writing, but what I like to do too is get those things and just walk for like five, 10 minutes and just put it on a voice text and just talking to my phone and we'll just write down what you're saying. I mean, it gets a lot of misspellings and I, I don't talk clear or something, but <laughs> okay. It's only for me. It doesn't matter. I'm not sharing it with everybody. So, and that's a good way to kind of keep your mind right. So I think it, for gra it keeps you in a better state of mind. And also when you talk about the manifestation principles, um, you know, I do think there is a thing when you're in a, in a state of gratitude, wh whether, you know, you're not doing it to get stuff, you know, you're not giving to get quote unquote, but there is that sort of thing of a, when you're in a state of gratitude, you are in a state of mentally, a state of receivership. It's like good things just keep flowing to you. We're just how, if you just like, Oh, this day sucks. You know, mm -hmm. I got cut off. This happened, this happened. Does it usually be like all of a sudden, like, Oh, then I walked in there randomly bought a lottery ticket. Now I'm a million dollars richer. That doesn't usually happen like that. It's like the shit just keeps compounding it worse and worse. Or it's, you know, better you know i've noticed that with a lot of things we get like better it's like if i'm you know doing work or something and things are just going well i don't apply this to training because i think you get yourself into trouble with, like regular work and stuff i won't stop sometimes just because the momentum's there yeah. and i think that state of gratitude right mindset and i think you can like you can really do a lot to trigger that and catalyze that and make it happen a lot more often if you're proactive yeah, well, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's kind of like you said earlier. It's it can go both ways. So if you if you like wake up in the morning and stub your toe and you're like son of a bitch, god damn it, and then all of a sudden you put on your underwear and it's and it rips, and then like it'll yeah. just travel through the whole day. Where if you were to stop and go, no, you know, wait a minute, I stubbed my toe, so what? And find that gratitude again. It could change how the rest of the day is going to go. People. 
that watch the news in the morning are reported to have a 27% chance of having what they call a bad day. So that's kind of like a, a thing of like sets that up that way. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, just using that example of like, you know, I've been guilty of this too. Like, but like, I remember like during COVID, some of the people that were like, you know, paranoid about it would be on there. Like, they'd be like, oh, you know, there's this many cases, you know, here and this and that. And like, it's this, and I'm like, are you leaving your house? No. Well, okay. So what are you getting out of this? Like at some, I mean, well, I want to be informed. Okay. So just go check it for 15 seconds every, every morning or afternoon. Like you're on there all night. So I think you can like make yourself kind of really into dark places and, and uh, you know, and all this stuff, it's, you don't want to necessarily be uninformed but at the same time. Like if you are informed, what are you doing with it? I mean, it's sort of like Tim Ferriss talking about in his book, one of his books, like, if you quit watching the news, you know, eventually, if something's important, if you talk to other people, you're going to hear about it. They'll yeah. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's going to cut. Yeah. Know. You're eventually going to hear about it if it's something you need to hear. Exactly. So, like, if, you know, I think we can do a lot of like, if you think about all the times you've like self sabotage and like anybody like just watching the news, whatever we're doing that's like making you in a worse place mentally. You know what the positive part about that is the opposite's gonna be true too. Mm -hmm. You could like beat yourself up by doing certain things too and 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 that kind of thing. Yeah, I did uh I did a podcast before this one where I was talking about kind of the sense of gratitude and how how that affects everything else down the line. So basically with parasympathetic and sympathetic, if you're if you let yourself get stressed out, you're in a sympathetic state. So your body is not healing and recovering like it could. So if you're hardcore into like, I want to meet this goal in the gym, what you do outside has a major impact on that. And yeah, just from the body functions, and we know that feeling a sense of gratitude actually helps align your, your heart and your mind and your body functions better and does what it's supposed to do. I think what you do outside matters a ton. Like that, that's, you know, I, I, to me, what you just said is obvious, but I think a lot of people listening probably that haven't really looked into this yet wouldn't know that hundred percent. I would go even further and say the way you view what you're doing affects it. So like mm -hmm. if you're viewing your goals in the gym as okay, we're talking about that senior nationals or whatever, like I got a total say, you know, whatever I did there, 22, I think it was like 2276 or something, yeah. somewhere like right about there. Okay. I have to total 2,300 because that was my goal for that meet. Okay. So am I a failure? Well, not really because I hadn't even totaled 2,200 before that. So like by shooting, for, but the point being, that was what I was, that was what I was expecting to happen. And I, I actually had, they called my third attempt deadlift. Now I'm not saying they shouldn't have, it was a good call. It was a hitch, but had they been in a generous mood, I would have had it. Right a gift but hey i've gotten gifts before so it's not totally out of the question and point being like that was a huge thing but i've made the goal even though ultimately that's what i wanted to happen i expected to happen i believe what would happen i ultimately made the goal about making you know each workout maximizing and hitting the weights i need to hit that day so it becomes a process goal not an outcome goal outcome goal is like um you know you can have outcome I guess it's more performance goal. You have outcome goals is I want to win the meet. That's, you know, the hardest kind of goal to achieve and the worst for most people, because let's say my goal is 2,300, I have 2,600. But all of a sudden at that point, Gary Frank's, you know, somehow drops to 308 and hits 2,700. I lose. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good, you know, such a big PR. There's nothing you can do about that. It can't really affect other people. That, so there's that that's a outcome a performance goal was what what i had the 2300 you know being aware enough to know that i don't know who the hell is going to be there you know powerlifting especially then was a weird sport because you go some years to the senior nationals you know like 1980 wins it or something yeah. another year like you know when gary frank the apf seniors total like 25 2600 you know before that people were winning it the super heavy, it's a 2200 tops. It just came out of nowhere. Yeah. You really don't know what was going to happen. Cause like, and there wasn't like Instagram and stuff where you'd be like, Oh, random dude, like in Hartford, Connecticut, it's just, you know, repping 800 at the gym and didn't even know what power thing was, but now he's gonna do a meet. So, Oh, okay. He'll probably deadlift over 800. There wasn't like that. I mean, 
as you know, like to, to upload a video on like your website or something costs money, right? Like yeah. you, you, like a sponsorship then for like, you know, sponsorship would be like, if someone was willing to pay to host your website, you know, it's nothing now, but back then it'd be like expensive all those videos and stuff. So you had no idea what's going on. So made each goal about the, about the process mm -hmm. hitting, you know, like be your diet, anything of like, I'm going to hit X amount of calories. X amount of protein, you know, I'm going to train four days a week. I'm going to come focus. I'm going to do my, you know, rested. All that stuff is about the process. And the problem with the outcome or the performance goals is until they happen, you're not, you're not in that grat, you're not in that state of gratitude. You're in a state of lack in a lot of ways, because I haven't hit that. I haven't made it till I do this. And that can be motivating for sure. However, at the same time, you want to focus on the small victories. I think you want to go into something with momentum. I, I mean, may, and I know everybody's a little different. I've never been that person. It's like, you know, I, I still remember that, you know, coach and, you know, sixth grade that yelled at me. And every time I go in the weight room, I think of that asshole. I've always been focused on what I want to do. Right. And enjoying the process. I know if anybody's been shitty along the way and you, you do well, they'll see it eventually. And, and that's good enough. I don't, I don't really want to waste time going back rubbing anybody's face that might have done me wrong at some point you know kind of thing so yeah. there's that part of it too but i think the focusing on those small daily wins and succeeding you know one workout at a time one meal at a time that kind of thing is a process goal where you keep your goals are on the process and i think that's a huge way to catalyze a, a positive growth mindset that's that's actually really interesting for for a couple reasons first reason is <clears throat> i remember uh I can't remember. It was a long time ago, but AD did a cone, did a post about like, Hey, I just tried to do better each meet. I wasn't thinking about this, this long-term stuff. And it was funny. Cause I, I can't remember if I texted him or sent him a message or whatever, but yeah. I was like, I go, Eddie, that's weird. Cause I go, that's exactly the way I thought about it too. And now you're saying you thought about it that way. And again, this is, Oh, here's a commonality between all these top athletes that I, that I continue to see where guys aren't thinking this huge long-term goal or they're, they have the long-term goal, but they're thinking about the short, the small goals. Well, and I think it's like, you kind of put the goal, the long-term on paper in the beginning and kind of like, okay, here's what I want to be. But then at that point, the focus becomes on what I do need to get there. I mean, this is even like, I mean, even like in business or anything else, you know, all the people I know that are always like have been like, I've come across and in, in like all sorts of fields, that have some grand goal of, um, you know, make a gazillion dollars and stuff. They don't ever focus on stuff right now. It's like always like when this happens, but for that to happen, there has to be a lot in between to happen. So you're going to build momentum and small victories where that becomes an expectation. You know, all the get rich quick kind of people, they, they don't usually succeed because their MO is failure. They, they've set these long-term goals and they never succeed in them. So like, it's like literally, you know, as I would say, like it could be raining pussies and, and they're going to hit the forehead of the dick is I don't know better where to put them. <laughs> kind of thing. It's like, you know, it's like just whatever they do just doesn't work out. It's just because they're so used to failure. That's who they be. That's not who they're born to be, but that's who they've become. And it's be by their own, just kind of always focusing on what's way far off instead of what's here and now. Yeah, and if you if you set up those small goals, you're successfully you're winning a lot. Winning all the time, and it's going to be a whole lot easier to to have to be gracious and have that feeling of gratitude with each little win, than than focusing. Also, on just goal. enjoyment. Like, let's just say you hit the goal of like you want to hit twenty five hundred pound total, and you get there, but you just looked at everything else to get there as something that sucked. I mean, what's that? You're gonna yeah. enjoy five minutes. Okay, go to the meet, enjoy it for five minutes, go out and celebrate after. Then, like, the next morning you wake up and then what? You know, like, or you have made all these great memories of, like, you know, I always thought it was fun. Like, when I lived in California, I drove really far and trained with Paul Leonard and, and Art Labar. You remember them? I'm, yep. I know both of those guys. Yeah. So, we would, I would drive about 140 miles to train with them at Paul's, at Paul's garage and later at Manny Sanchez's. And, I mean, it was like a whole experience. I get up at like really early in the morning, 
I'd stop to eat breakfast at a certain place, stop at 7-Eleven right before I got there. All that stuff to basically, and it was like a fun thing. It was something I looked forward to. It wasn't just like, oh, shit, I got to drive for two and a half hours. It sucks. And like, when I hit the total, maybe it'll be worth it. It was like, no, it was like kind of embracing the whole experience and making it a fun thing of like training was fun. Then hanging out with these guys and bullshitting after was fun. Like all that kind of stuff. It wasn't just like some kind of torturous, you know, type of thing. Yeah, I still have um, everybody I had on my team back when I was competing, their family. So I still, we still get together today and tell stories and look back at all the, it's not stories about the competitions. It's stories about the training and that process. <laughs> that was so much fun. And I, for me, I always tell people, I go, I like to set three goals. I'll set like, hey, here's I want to do this in this competition. Hmm. Then I'll set this huge grandiose goal. Like in 10 years, I want to be like one of the best in the world. And then I go back right. and go, okay, in order to hit either one of those, I have to have these small goals. And where then, are you in Reno or where? I'm in Reno. What gym are you at now? Uh, <clears throat> I train out of my garage and I train my clients out of my garage. That's cool. Um, I'm actually looking to expand. I want to move to Pahrump, which is just outside Vegas. And I'm working on the land. We're having some issues with getting the land deal done, but hopefully that'll get done soon. And is it so is that is that like a suburb of Vegas or like a, a kind of different town in more that direction? Pahrump is actually about 45 minutes outside of Vegas, cool. which for me is because I'm a little tend to be on the antisocial side. It kind of keeps me away from it, but then I'm actually still close. And Vegas is becoming a, there's a lot of, lot of lifters and stuff down there right now. And it's growing like crazy. Yeah. And a lot of good, you know, good place to eat and shop and all that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So that's where I'm looking. Cause I want to expand my gym. How big is Reno? Uh, Reno's pretty big now. It's growing every year a ton. Like almost, I was, I almost been there one time for um, Gus Rethwich's uh, meet, two thousand three. Yeah, he, he used to hold Wab the Worlds here all the time. What was that hotel? Was that like the, that was at the, the Pepper Mill? Pepper Mill, and it was like, yeah, that that was awful that week. It was like it wasn't snowing, so but you know that cold rain is worse yeah. than snow. Yeah, that's one but, reason I want to move because yeah, it still snows here. I want to move south. I don't. I'm done with snow. I'm done with rain. I'm done with all that shit. No, totally. I'm. A, I'm. A, I like the sun. I love riding my BMX bikes and like I want to ride all year. Is Vegas warm in the? I've never been out there in the winter. Time. I mean, I've only been once in the winter time. It was kind of cold actually. But it'll it'll get down in like the fifties, and like once every ten like, years it might flurry. Yeah, it's not too different from here. Okay. Yeah, which I'm I'm more into that. For sure. But I can't I'm getting to where I can't handle commercial gyms anymore. I I only go to one commercial one. I mean, I guess the other ones are, are sort of commercial sometimes, but like just because I don't do a lot of heavy benching and stuff anymore. Because really the only injuries I've had that are serious is like my elbow I've had elbow surgery, but I've like pretty injury free. So the only thing is that like of just like, you know, stuff I have here. I don't have a ton of machines. I like cables and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. I feel like I get, like for more of the pump type of work can take advantage of the machines that in 24 fitness, like 10 bucks a month or something. Yeah. 10 minutes away. But what I do is I'll go at like, you know, I got, it's a zoo, even like semi prime time hours could be like a zoo and, and you got just got to go at the right time of day and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Definitely annoying when people are like, on a certain machine and they're just like texting. I mean, I I don't, I know people have hassles with people. I do the opposite. I'm like, you know what? I'm not competing. So if I was going to do this machine, instead of like working in with you, getting mad at you, I will just do this one instead to avoid you. Yeah. Do my thing. That's, that's where I am too. I kind of, it's when you, when you go into actual, like the talking about training, it's interesting to me because there's a lot of people that are super, super specific about stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, there's like a lot of different exercises to work different muscles. So I would well, eating or something. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be like, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'd rather just not deal with it and I'll go do this one. Like, I don't care. I can find, yeah, I can well, find ways like, to work that muscle. I can work my upper back a variety of ways, but like, 
socializing with you doesn't, you know, it's just like, it's like, I mean, there's zombies. I had, I had, I didn't, I should post the video again. I'll send it to you if I can find it. It's, um, I was over there one time and it was snowing here. So like it was, yeah, I don't snow in my but icing for sure. Like you couldn't walk, like it was like for here, they don't have, it's not used to that that often. So it's like dangerous because they don't have road crews. Like you'd be really careful when you walk, you, like people, like the injuries here would be like people slipping and stuff. Right. So I walked outside, my friend came over here and we were work out and he was like, there's no way. And it was like, it was too icy. And we go to 24 fitness and it got to like a weird, they like first kept trying to sell him a membership. And he, I just remember he was fine. Like, how much is it to work out here? I'll just pay if I don't have to talk to him. <laughs> and they're like, okay, you're being honest. Thank you. You can like work out for free today. Okay, cool. So kind of a weird start to the day. We're going and legit. Um, I was doing um, farmer's walks. So they have a turf area. It was like um, five plates on this, on the bar on each side. Plus it's like one of those heavy trap bars, like 75 pounds. So I guess 525. I had a weighted vest on that weighed like 60 or 80 pounds. It was like a huge one with all those. And it wasn't like one of those ones where you can like move around real good. It's like the kind you can't run and you can only walk real fast. It's like, like lead or whatever, like yeah. you scoop with. So I had like no chance of stopping there, dude, I'm going pick it up. Right. Been doing it all day. Like we'd been doing it for like probably a half hour. We'd done tons of sets. And people notice it. Like people are cool there. They're not like jerks. They're like they don't know what we're doing. Oh, that's awesome, man. You know, like come by high five and us and stuff. And like so, people were. It wasn't like we were like under the radar. This fool comes in there from across the gym, literally, like walks. I'm saying like five feet away, dude. When I'm I picked it up, I'm running, and I'm going fast with this thing. And he literally missed me by about that much. Oh finally and like i couldn't have like stopped because you gotta think i got 525 on the bar my body weight plus that like 80 pound vest there's no way to stop i don't know what would happen to him or me if i hit him like obviously he's up shit creek because he's about 180 pounds i don't think i'm probably in the best position yeah you no know? the gym's not gonna be happy about it but it was literally because he had his phone like this and i have a video of it somewhere and it's like he didn't realize it till like right at the last second. It kind of like hopped up. It was so weird. And he literally like walked on the turf like that close in front of me. That's yeah, and that's like, crazy. I don't I don't think I could ever go. We got we have some cool gyms here in town, but I every time I go in there, I'm just I just shake my head. And I'm like, I don't even even when I when I was still training clients at one of the gyms, my my clients would be like, blinders, Chad, blinders. Cause we'd go by somebody and like, they're doing just these horrible squats and it would just aggravate me. Cause I'm like, they can ask, like, I've never told anyone, no, anyone that's ever asked me anything. I spend time and help them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, that's the thing is that my gym is like, yeah, if you spend time, if you go to these gyms and spend time trying to help people, you drive yourself crazy. I, I'm like the opposite. I'm not trying to help anybody there. I'm also not trying to like be a problem. I just, like don't even see human beings there i just see silhouettes yeah i mean it's just doing my thing and that's my friends like you're gonna go like you can tell that guy to get out of your way i'm like nope he's like you gonna go say sorry because you almost hit him i'm like no i'm like <laughs> it, it's like i can't let him occupy the mental space i'm here to like be my best make gains not you know try to you know beat up a 180 pound guy that's ob oblivious or you know, that's one of those mental choices you're people. making for your, for your, yeah. Best. Or profusely apologize for what's his fault. I mean, it, let's just move on with it. Like he didn't seem too bothered by it. He's just went upstairs and on his way. And yeah, I got the rest of a workout to do. You know, if we see each other later and like out in town, we can all laugh about it, but I'm here to, to train, not to yeah. make friends. With enemies. <laughs> that's where I, even my actually my clients and i had this i talked to joe i was on joe defranco's podcast at one point okay and we were talking about that too and this was right after he moved from his big facility back to a smaller facility and okay. he, in texas or huh he was in texas for a while right but he's yeah back this was when he was back in um okay. the east coast and you know he's got pro football players and shit and yeah. he goes, everybody was so much happier when he moved back into a small facility. And like, even my clients that train with me now, 
And I mean, I can run five guys out of my garage at the same time. And it's like, right. everybody just has to pay attention, but everybody's like, I don't think I can go back to a regular gym now. <laughs> and I go, yeah, there's still something about that kind of underground. Like, yeah, we don't have all the equipment, but we can make this work kind of attitude, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, that's what you like at the end of the day, what do you, what, you know, that's it. So like my more serious stuff, it's heavier and stuff and harder. I do here. Yeah. You know, definitely it's like, well, thing, and I, I usually train alone or like my kids will come out and hang out with me or something, but like, it's one of those deals of like, I always tell people that um, good company is the best company, but there, you know, there's no worse company than bad company. Being alone is better than bad company. So you go, mm -hmm. the perfect situation was like, we we're talking about earlier, like art and Paul, great training partners. That's going to be the best way to do things if possible. But, you know, as you're not competing and stuff, you can't, it, it's tough to justify, you know, aligning your life around everybody else's schedule and then for them doing it around yours, it's kind of like, it's tougher, yeah. but like we're in the midst of it, that's the best way to do it. But I definitely have had really good workouts alone, much better that, you know, no company is better than bad company. As I always say, I have, I, I train a lot by myself and I don't mind it, but I grew up doing that. And then even now, every now and then I like to, I'll try to train with my clients just mm -hmm. to go, listen, this is the speed I expect. This is the intensity I yeah, expect. Sure. And I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. And it is fun. Like I have a couple groups that, that, that when I train with them, it is fun to actually have everybody focus and see how everything really picks up. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the thing is I was about, you know, trail alone too. If like, I, if I wanted to like go crazy or something, go to Metroflex or something. And then that's, it's like, definitely you can feel the intensity pick up right when you walk in. And there is that sort of like, you know, next level pool you can draw from if you, if you want to and need to for yeah. sure. But there's nothing like, you know, a, a, the energy train of a bad, bad clients. I mean, a bad, it's, it's tougher to find, you know, a good, a good training partner is a good woman. As I always say, it's definitely the truth. Mm -hmm. I was like, you're crazy saying that. I said, no, Go to the Baptist church over there. You meet, you know, a thousand members, probably 50 nice girls there. How many people are those people you want to train with? I bet you won't find nobody in there you want to train with. It's, the truth, it's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> All right, Josh, I know you, I got to let you All go right. here soon. Um, I really appreciate you being on. I mean, if, if, hey, I would love to have you on again. I think there's tons of stuff we could Do still it. talk about, um, especially the sprinting. I like, I like all the sprinting stuff that you do. So if people want to look you up and find your information, I know you got a bunch of great manuals and stuff out there. Just jailhousestrong.com or. Oh yeah. It? So that for the Instagram jailhouse strong, the website though, we better go joshstrength.com. Okay. I got more stuff on there and just in general um, for Twitter or X, I guess it's called now Josh strength. Um, and then um, that be any of these, the Instagram, Twitter, um, or, or my website would be the best way to get a hold of me. I'm, I'm not hard to find. Yeah, I know you got, uh, yeah, you have a bunch of manuals. All the books are I actually, Amazon. I didn't know you had the book. You said you have the book on the um, the growth and fixed mindset. Yeah, you so I got two of them. So, um, Jailhouse Strong, the Successful Mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I need to pick that one up. I didn't even know you had that one. I'd like to read it. Like, like $2.99 or something on Amazon. Yeah. And then, um, the other one's called grounded and gratitude. That's a little deeper. So like jailhouse strong and successful mindset. Mm -hmm. It kind of like a good for somebody like not bought into this kind of stuff that wants to read something in an hour or so that might, I would say be like, kind of like a gateway drug for that's probably not a good way to, <laughs> to this kind of stuff. A, a gateway, to the, gateway drug to the successful mindset would be that book because it's going to give you enough seeds, you know, ideas, things you can implement, mm -hmm. but not like a major change. It's kind of like if you get into lifting weights, you get into five, three, one, Mark Rippers of starting strength, something like that would kind of get you your feet wet, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you love it, then you could go to something more advanced. Right. But if nothing else, you got a good base to, to make some gains right off the bat. The next one be grounding gratitude. That one is longer. That one actually has exercises and things to do. It's not just like a, a book you read. So you got two of that. And that one, both of them have quite a bit of information on the growth mindset those should be i'm gonna look into those i'll do a post on my instagram yeah. for people to find them because i i just think that's one of the big things that's missing 
with a lot of people. I don't care if your goal is to, yes, you want to bench 315 or you want to lose 15 pounds. I think mindset is really the place to start. Yeah, I think it is too. And I think there's a lot of, I think, um, try to do a good job of, of making it like understandable and accessible and actionable in the sense of like a lot of, a lot of people will post on it and stuff, but don't really have anything to go. You know, if you said like, Hey, you know, your life will be better if you get stronger. Okay. Well then like the next thing would be like, how to get stronger? Like it give some examples and that kind of thing. So I think that's where like grounded in gratitude really picked up the, the slack mm -hmm. is it was an actionable plan in there. It's not just like, Oh, well, like, you know, quit, you know, adopt a growth mindset and, you know, where I do feel like, the successful mindset book is more that way, but it's a good way to kind of get you involved. It like kind of get you into this realm. And then the grounded and gratitude takes it to the next level. If you want to really go all in for sure. Yeah. Get people in, introduce them to it, give them some understanding, give them something to think about and then go, all right, Nahir, now read this one. And we're really going to show you how to do it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, Josh, I pre appreciate you being on. It was great getting to talk to you. Um, I always, yeah, I, I always seem to take it. something yeah, I, away. I enjoyed this a lot, and I would definitely do it again. I thought this was very productive and fun. Cool. All right, I'm going right, to hit my outro. All right, buddy. Thanks for listening to the Courage Barbell Unlimited podcast. For more information, Recording please visit stopped. couragebarbell.com. Until next time.